The following interview was conducted with Mary Ann Zimmerman, Purdue alumna, uh, civil engineering 1966 with a bachelor's and her master's in civil engineering in 1968. For the Purdue University Oral History Program, it took place on November the 11th, 2009 in Stewart Center Purdue, on the Purdue campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Mary Ann, and thank you. And uh, let's start off by telling me where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., Georgetown Hospital, uh, and uh, have what no year siblings. Were you, what year were you uh, born? I was born in uh, 1945. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, my parents were uh, Robert and Anna Zimmerman. They met during the Second World War. They were both in the Army. Uh, my mother was one of the first wax uh, out of uh, Boston. My father was from Chicago. Father was a, a Purdue graduate, 1932 in civil engineering, okay. and my mother uh, was a graduate from what was then Fitchburg State Teachers College. It's uh, now Fitchburg uh, University in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Uh, and they actually met in Michigan at Fort Custer. Uh, what my father likes liked to say was uh, he was assigned uh, to uh, see my mother around. Uh, Fort Custer, she was bringing in the first group of WACs and was never relieved of duty. Uh, <laughs> Sounds <and> so, good. <laughs> yes. And so I, I sort of uh, grew up understanding and believing the military was supposed to be part of my life. Uh, and indirectly it has been, I'll have to admit, I never uh, personally joined the military, but it worked, uh, especially with my current job, uh, with a lot of military. Okay. Sounds good. What about grade school and high school? Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, um, moved around a lot. Actually only lived uh, in Washington when I was in the hospital. Spent a few months uh, living in Virginia and then at the end of the Second World War, the August, uh, we were moving to Chicago. Lived in Chicago for several years, then moved to a small town in Michigan called Climax, Michigan, a town of about 500. And while living there, I uh, went to kindergarten first and I believe second grade at a small Catholic school about 20 miles away. Uh, we moved to Bay City, Michigan, a town of 50,000 at that time, uh, where I went to grade school and through ninth grade, uh, again at Catholic schools. Uh, and then we moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan, when I was in 10th grade, uh, where I moved to a public high school from 10 through 12. Uh, we lived in Kalamazoo through the time I was at Purdue, and when I graduated in 68, my parents moved from Kalamazoo to Jackson, Michigan, um, and we kidded about how they, they moved and left no forwarding address, but I found out where they were in any case. <laughs> okay. Did your father maintain his career, was his career primarily, did he stay in the military most of his time? Then? Uh, Is that he, what, oh, okay. <laughs> He, he uh, was in the military in the reserves for 20 years, but oh, okay. his career was uh, civil engineering in construction. Okay. okay. And he worked for a construction company based out of Chicago. He was in, then in charge of their Michigan operations. And so we moved the various places because of major projects. Mm -hmm. uh, in Climax, we were living there because there was a project near Kalamazoo of building a pow major power plant. We moved up to Bay City. Uh, for a power plant and then a major uh, bridge across, uh, I think it was the Saginaw River, and uh, then moved back to Kalamazoo uh, for uh, other work uh, mm -hmm. that he had. Right. Okay, that sounds good. When you were in high school, any student, any or student organizations or clubs that uh, you participated in? Uh, I participated in in a, a number of different things. Okay. Uh, one. Uh, was uh, the Girls Athletic Association okay. uh, because and we played uh, basketball the half court uh, system because the rules hadn't changed then and uh, since it was an athletic association it was before there were girls sports in high school so we were able to have two or three games a year which big excitement uh, with a couple of the other uh, high schools uh, you know nobody came to see them we just played uh, ourselves and actually had a good time. Good. Um, I also, I believe I was parliamentarian uh, at some point in high school and part of that uh, was it was a good way to 
participate in what was going on in school, uh, to be part of the system, um, and I at least learned Robert's rules of order. That's very key. <laughs> yeah, and a, a couple of things around that, because it was sort of non-school things. You made me think a bit about, hmm, what are some commonalities in my life, and why have I done some of the things that I have? Sure. And two things, uh, a couple of things that, that popped up. One is my parents were always very involved in the community. And one of the things they were very involved in were po politics, politics at the community level, state level, national level. Uh, when I was in Bay City, sort of elementary school, uh, I used to go to all the political meetings. Uh, my parents were, uh, went to the Democratic state conventions. I used to go with them, and I loved smoke-filled rooms. So, I mean, all this <laughs> stuff about smoking has been really hard to, to get used to. Um, we, uh, my parents were involved enough that I got to know all of the uh, state uh, Democratic elected officials in the 50s. So G. Men and Williams, who then went on to, uh, to, to deal uh, with African affairs with somebody that had been at our house. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Phil Hart and his family uh, had come to uh, our house. Uh, John Swainson, who was former military who had been injured uh, during the war and then became uh, governor of Michigan, was somebody else uh, that I got to meet. So the, the being involved in the community was something that was sort of central to uh, my growing up. Sure. The other part of it was um, the world. Uh, when I was in ninth grade, we had an exchange student from Germany. And until probably the last five years, uh, I still had contact with the family. Isn't that nice? It she, is. Did they live, she live with you, stay at your yes. house? Oh, okay, yeah. good. And then and when I was a senior in high school, we had a, an exchange student from Mexico the oh. following Super. Summer, I went to Mexico City, stayed with her family. Oh, how nice. And again, we uh, have stayed in touch um, since then. That's very nice. Yeah, like, the, 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 like the old pen pal things that people used to have years ago. Well, and, you know, and international, uh, right. Right. And, and it's, to some extent, uh, seeing the world in the sense that the family I stayed with in Mexico, the parents were both medical doctors. And so this was, what, 40 years ago, both the husband and wife were medical doctors. Wow. Uh, so they were uh, middle class. They worked in public health. They chose not, they chose to do that. They had a, a health clinic and they worked in hospitals. Um, I stayed with them during the 1968 Olympics uh, when I stayed with them as an exchange student. They made sure that I saw Mexico as they understood it. And so I got a much better feeling uh, for what middle class people in Mexico in urban areas uh, believed, saw, were issues, cared about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so again, the, the caring about a community was something that I, I guess probably lucked out in staying with a family that had very similar views on the world as my own parents. Sure. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Just worked out extremely well for you. Yes. Good. Um, then uh, after high school is then, how did you happen to come to Purdue? Because your father had been here or did that? <laughs> that, that certainly didn't hurt. <laughs> um, at that time, um, what at least my parents uh, said was the way you do things is you apply to two, three, four schools of different types. Um, I knew sort of what I didn't want to do, which is I didn't want to be a teacher, I didn't want to do research, but what I was good in was math and science. Uh -huh. And so trying to figure out, okay, what could you do? So I applied to three schools. One of them was Purdue. Purdue was the large um, state school. Um, known to my parents, uh, especially my father, because he had gone there. And we went and visited all of the three schools, Purdue going to freshman engineering to find out what was uh, engineering all about. Uh, one of the things that they said was that, hey, if you come into engineering, you do freshman engineering, there are a lot of requirements. But if you decide then you don't want to do it, you could move into something else, you lose nothing. You have all your electives for almost anything else you could go into, hmm, okay. number one. Okay. The second thing that happened is Purdue, and probably still does something like this, uh, had uh, an early enrollment 
but they also had just really good mail, maybe now uh, electronic communications. And they had sent me enough things. Uh, and and uh, before the end of the middle of my senior year had accepted me, that I was so convinced by the time I heard from the other schools in the spring, it was too late for them. Okay. I was signed up, said, yep, I'm going there. Super. Right on, they're right on target, getting the material out to you. Yes, and, and it was the right decision. Sure, okay. And uh, did they have uh, something like day on campus then, or any? Or what was the orientation like? Did you come down before classes started? Yes, they, okay. they uh, did have a day on campus. Okay. Uh, I also remember coming down, oh, probably the weekend or week before school started, and there were some early on things. Okay. Uh, and while there were not, women in engineering programs had not started, freshman engineering and uh, Dr. Al, Albert Spaulding, uh, Dean McDowell were there, and they, that whole freshman engineering was a very important thing for me and I think for the, the women students right, um, right. on campus at that time. Right. Were the, um, was freshman engineering an ENAD at that time? And engineering, yeah. Okay, so it was there until it moved over to Armstrong, where you know, which is yes. where it's learned. Okay. Right. Dick McDowell, I, I, I knew him, met him, and you probably had heard he has passed away. I think I had heard that, right. yes. He passed away within the last year. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Well, tell us a little about uh, college, including I had mentioned to you you are the treasurer of Mortar Board, and yes. uh, that slide rule thing, you, we have a nice collection. It's been turned over to the archives, but uh, your slide rule is part of the collection, along well, with I, many other I, people. I had forgotten about that. Uh -huh. um, and what I remember is it took me a long Bob time. Miles, to isn't Dr. Bob Miles yeah. is the one that was in, uh, getting got that thing together? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, and what I found uh, from the slide rule is it took me a long time to learn how to really use it. Uh -huh. And uh, I could, I often double check by hand uh, to, to make sure where the decimal point went. Uh, so <laughs> okay. uh, don't tell anybody in civil engineering, but giving it up was not a hard thing to do because <laughs> I never okay. used it uh, quite all that much. Uh, but it did, it did help a bit. Sure. Um, I must have been of the generation or just nature to join things uh, because uh, in thinking about things I had belonged to on campus, one, I, I was part of Mortar Board, but okay. I was also part of, of uh, ASCE, I was part of uh, Society of Women Engineers. Uh, Did I was that exist, that was going at that time then, SWE? Was, yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. And I can tell you a little bit more about that. Oh, sure. Um, sure. Gold Peppers, Tall sure. Beta Pi, because I was in band. Uh, I was a member of Chi Ep, uh, Chi Epsilon, the civil engineering uh, honorary. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, it, it, one an activity that I got very involved in that, again, uh, I remember a lot about was the mock political convention, which may not even exist. Uh, you don't hear very much about that anymore. But I, I, having been in the archives and working there, I, I, I'm aware of that organization. Well, I get uh, confused about which years there actually have been national conventions, but Purdue, uh, for most or all of the time, they had uh, Mach P, uh -huh. uh, even though it was a thing where it was Republican, Democrat, you know, you were trying to come up with a team sure. uh, of who was going to get elected. Um, they came out with the winner mm -hmm. uh, every time. Okay. In any case, uh, I think I was a sophomore going into civil engineering, B.B. Lewis was my advisor, um, and during the summer, uh, the housing unit I was in, whoever was in charge, we had Alabama, and that person either left school or was no longer able to be in charge, and so I became the chair for Alabama <laughs> for the mock political convention, and what I knew about Alabama was nothing. Um, I got a, a subscription to the Birmingham Times newspaper. I talked to B.B. Lewis. He looked in uh, the directory and found every graduate student and professor who had any connection to Alabama, and there were not a lot. So there were about five or six. We made contact, and I learned all about Alabama by talking to them in the newspaper. And so it was fascinating because I'm from, my parents are Northerners, I'm a Northerner, sure. and at that time, knowing anything about the South. Um, was not well because that time uh, was was 
right at the start of some of the, the, the more recent civil rights activities. And so there, there were a lot of tensions. And so uh, knowing what was going on uh, from uh, somebody from Alabama's viewpoint was just really, really interesting. Oh, I would say so, right. Right on target, too. Very, very timely. Yes, yes. Um, other things that, that were important to me, because I mentioned freshman engineering, and Violet Haas was there then, Felix Haas, Violet Haas, right. and she was one of the advisors, along with a woman engineer who was not practicing, who lived in Lafayette. They were, they were the sponsors of the SWE chapter. Okay. Uh, at the time I was at Purdue, and you've, you've probably heard this, but there were 25 freshmen who entered uh, engineering, and it was less than half of 1%. Uh, there were five of us that continued in engineering to our sophomore year, and there were three of us that graduated. Wow. I was in civil, there was a woman in industrial, and a woman in aeronautical engineering. Wow. So if you look at that base, cause, and there were a few graduate students, but they, not many, and they tended not to be members of SWE. Mm -hmm. okay. So we, we had a group of probably no more than 20 SWE members. And we thought we were pretty weak and wondered, what, should we even exist? And it ended up that that year we won an award from SWE for our activities. And because we did meet, we did do some things, and it was the support of freshman engineering and Violet Haas, and I'm sorry that I don't remember the woman from Lafayette, our sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, and their support of us that helped us. And we probably had 80 to 90 percent of the women engineering students in SWE at that point. Wow. So SWE is an organization uh, in, in helping uh, women students, and I think that's carried on even after the women in engineering programs got started. Sure, I think so. It's very very active and very strong and, and unified, too. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Good. Did, uh, I uh, wanted to, go ahead. I, I, have to, I have to say uh, one other thing of who were some really important people on campus uh, were the deans. Okay. Uh, and. I was on campus, you know, the, the week of the 24th, and that's when they had the, the uh, drawings of uh, the first three dean of students, all of whom oh, were Oh, the women. portraits, yes, of yeah. um, Nelson and Cook and uh, Stone. Stone. Uh -huh. And uh, Dean Schleeman was there when I started, and Dean Stone and Cook uh, and Barbara Ells Ellsbury. Okay. Uh, and uh, Dean Zissus. Mm -hmm. And... Even as a freshman uh, living in X, the deans came to dinner. And I met Dean Stone first as a freshman uh, at one of the dinners. She just sat at my table. And that group of women uh, I have stayed in touch with ever since I was a freshman. Wow. That's because it, they, they were also links into Mortar Board. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and their links to the students. I always thought that group of women were the most progressive at Purdue uh, during the time I was there and probably some time after, uh -huh. which is their becoming uh, the first dean of students, uh, I think spoke well for Purdue and some of the, the changes that have come from being a, a big but Midwestern uh, landlocked university uh, into sort of what it's working to become more of as a, as a global institution. Sure, exactly. Okay, yeah, all right. Um, any, go ahead, on anything else on the, um, uh, when you were here as, as a student that you can think of? And you lived in the, did you live in the residence hall the whole time, Mary Ann? No, you go, okay. as, a, as a freshman I lived in X. Okay. And then I lived in Sigma Kappa uh, sorority. Okay, okay. And uh, I was uh, an officer there also, and I always forget what I did and what things. But what, what was good um, for me with that, because, I mean, there were still hours at that point. <laughs> so uh, what was it? I think 10 o'clock during the week and either 11 o'clock or midnight on weekends, you had to be in or you would be locked out. Um, and so uh, that ended up being a nice group of people, several of whom I still keep in touch with. Um, but, you know, some, some of the dynamics on campus, um, computers were just getting started. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and so that's where the slide rule was uh, the help that it was. Sure. Um, but also there were a lot of files. And uh, people studied for the lab courses by having files. Um, well, there were not 
files for engineering courses in uh, the women's residence units because there were no or very few women in engineering. And so I typically had no files uh, to go after. And while it took a while, uh, the professors in civil engineering sort of saw that I had, I think, fairly unique lab reports. And I was one of the few that was actually trying to do the lab reports. The guys were all copying from the previous year. <laughs> and, and so several of them let me know that, hey, uh, you are in fact getting credit. We do understand while you're getting a lot of things wrong, you're at least trying. You might actually be learning. And there was one professor in structures uh, that offered up every lab and every test that he had ever given to any student that wanted to come look, copy, anything else, if they came to his office. I was one of the very few that ever went. And he did it for a reason. It was to get to know the student. I got to know him uh, when I was in graduate school, even though I wasn't in structures. Uh, my office was right down the hall from him. And so, again, I got to talk to him about, about school, about civil engineering, sure. et cetera. Sure. Uh, the other thing was in structures, one of the courses, uh, there was a professor, Hayes. I had him. He thought that it was really important to understand the basics of what you were doing. What's the theory behind it? How does it get applied? The other professor uh, wanted to get the students to use this new contraption, the computer. And so we took the same course in absolutely different fashions. So I learned how to do it in quotes by hand, but I learned uh, you know, all the, the details of if things went wrong, why. Mm -hmm. uh, but I learned less about the computer. Uh, the other thing that happened, and it may have only been for the few women students, but Professor Hayes, for probably 20 years after I graduated, and I know a couple of other women civil engineering uh, graduates said the same thing, he sent us birthday cards. Oh, wow. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Anytime you go back on campus, of course you'd go back and catch up. Sure, right, exactly. Oh, terrific. Uh, what a what a nice environment to uh, you know enjoy your your years at, at uh, Purdue. Yes. And uh, after you get then you must have stayed on then to do the masters right after that. I did. Okay. Um, and uh, lived in an apartment. Okay. Um, and <laughs> I it was again in civil engineering, um, and there were actually several international students um, in traffic engineering, transportation. Okay. Uh, Harold Michael was my major professor. He was the head of transportation at that point. Okay. Um, all the guys were down in the bullpen uh, on like the second floor of the civil engineering building. Uh, there were two women uh, and we had uh, space up on the fourth floor. So uh, we always kidded, uh, he was trying to protect us. I have, I have <laughs> no idea of the why. Uh, but we had space, but we were also by the coffee room. And uh, one of the great things, uh, since I like sports a lot, and Purdue actually in football was really good then, in basketball not so. Um, but we, in, in while I was there, uh, got season tickets uh, to actually all the all the games. And there were a group of us in uh, graduate school that went to all the away games and had just a great time. And I started work three months late uh, because I had a season basketball ticket and the season wasn't over until March. <laughs> and I was not in a, a race uh, to you know, go to work. Um, and it was uh, all these things, what you remember. Sure. Uh, in graduate school, we went to the Rose Bowl for the first time and won with Bob Greasy and Leroy Keyes. Right. Uh, and also that was uh, my last semester is when uh, the basketball arena opened, uh, mm -hmm. and the first game was Rick Mount and then Luell Cinder, UCLA. Right. And so th th they're just uh, nice things in, in remembering. Why are sports important? You do remember them. It's the, it's the academics that you really get and, and are able to use later, but uh, the combination is very nice. That's right. I agree with you on that. <laughs> Um, that, well then, then move on to your career path, and after you finished, what, uh, where did you strike out for next? Um, the first job I had uh, was with American Public Works Association based in Chicago. Okay. Um, and 
I had two jobs while I was in Chicago where I lived for about five and a half years. Uh, with APWA, uh, I did what was actually a research project um, on how cities designed their major streets, arterial, what they called then arterial streets, um, when they were using their own money as opposed to having federal money help fund things. Okay. Okay. And so I did a, a 20 city study the summer of 1968. Mm -hmm. And that was, the importance of that was not only the study, uh, which was, imp I found out was important uh, 20 years later uh, when, I, when I came came back and we can get to that later because uh, it was a, a report that was actually reprinted um, two times over a 10-year period, which surprised me because I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, but the other thing that happened is this, Dr. King got killed April uh, of 68. I left Purdue in March of 68 and moved to Chicago. Okay. Uh, so that's when I started work. Um, he had come to uh, Chicago and started Operation Breadbasket. Somebody at my job was in the choir of Operation Breadbasket. Um, my 20 city tour uh, in almost every city, because the tour started after his death, hmm. um, for some reason uh, the traffic engineers or uh, public works officials that I dealt with wanted me to see where they had their riot. And so I got to learn a lot about social interactions around the United States at that very tense time. And the explanations were very different, different places. I mean, because I, I went all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in Los Angeles, I was in Washington, I went to I used Chicago, Atlanta, and also some smaller cities. I was in Phoenix uh, when Robert Kennedy was killed. And so, they're, they're, the whole thing around sort of civil rights, human rights, um, got caught into my work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was the first job. The second one was with the city of Chicago. And by that time, uh, I had uh, become an active volunteer worker uh, with Operation Breadbasket. And uh, they started uh, some black expos. And they started in Chicago at the International Amphitheater. And I was in charge of logistics. Hmm. Um, and is it, a volunteer. Uh, and of course, that was Operation Breadbasket was actively challenging uh, Mayor Daley and you know other kind uh, other places. Uh, and here I was, a, a city employee uh, who was in fact uh, under the sponsorship of Mayor Daley because I was not a political worker and I was you know also known as a, a patronage worker. Nor was I civil service. And what was fascinating is there really was no political pressure um, for me to act one way or another. Uh, while I was active in Breadbasket, uh, my boss with the city, who is another person I still see uh, every year at the, uh, in, in Washington at the Transportation Research Board meetings, we have dinner, he and his wife and I have dinner. His only advice to me was uh, understand, you know, uh, there are limits to what you can do. Don't do these things at work. I'm perfectly with you, uh, but uh, take things off uh, when you need to, but go do them. And so I did, and his wife, who was a school teacher, she called me because they were coming to Sesame Street at the International Amphitheater, for, which was at Black Expo. And so what should they do to get their bus in and out? Um, and so the, the dynamics sort of remain, it's one of the constants that I find in looking at uh, sort of what what have I done? Sort of using skills, uh, but in a in a sort of a human rights uh, global global per perspective. Right. Yeah, I understand. Okay, that's uh, that's good. And then, well, then, Marianne, after, did you after you there? What came next? Is that when you became a consultant, or were doing what? What came next? Ah, oh, heavens, no. And I I actually wrote down some other things. Good. I have to at least tell you uh, what I did at the uh, city of Chicago because. Okay. Um, there were some really interest, two interesting uh, things that I, I worked on. One uh, was I was in charge of a working level group looking at what should be done with State Street, which is a major street in central 
uh, Chicago. It was at the time where at Christmas in New York, uh, the citizens of New York got the city to close Fifth Avenue at Christmas time to cars, to vehicles, and make it a pedestrian only street uh, during the holiday shopping time. People in Chicago wanted to do the same thing. And the city wasn't really sure it wanted to do that because that was the major street for all bus traffic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we set up a working level group um, that put together a design of what then got implemented after I left and stayed for about 20 years, which was a, a pedestrian way. It maintained bus traffic, but became mostly a pedestrian street. Okay. Um, and and what, a piece of it that was interesting was we had the business community as part of the working group. The business community started with sort of a, we can't do this. It will kill our business. We don't want it. We won't agree. We'll come to your meetings, but no. And one of the things that I learned sort of about human nature is you talk about things long enough, you get more comfortable, you begin to understand them. And by the time, and this was over about a year and a half period, when the proposal finally went forward, the business community were proponents. Mm -hmm. They had seen how it could help them. They then wanted it. And so the proposal could go forward and get adopted and implemented because people found something that from the, the broad range of people found something that was workable in, for all of them. Right, okay. Uh, takes the other a little, thing that take, I got involved in were bicycle paths. Oh, okay. And um, these were city paths as opposed to things that the, the Chicago Park System has had paths for years and years and years. The city had not. And they were wondering what to do. And so uh, I sort of figured out uh, where should they go. And one of the things that they did was had one of the maybe first rush hour bike lanes from the near north side into the loop. Uh, also had some early bicycle parking areas in city parking garages in the loop. Uh, and then the other paths were connecting, may actually sort of parks, connecting parks uh, so that, that bicyclists could go on relatively safe streets and that cars would know that they should give right of way to uh, bicyclists because there were bicycle paths. Okay, okay. Wow, that's pretty, a nice challenge and be able to do something like that. That sounds great. <laughs> oh, it was great fun. Great yeah, fun. I think so. <laughs> then uh, I was in Chicago five and a half years, uh -huh. and because of, of some program that where I was at Purdue, um, I met a recruiter from Cummins Engine Company, and he called, and I accepted a position at Cummins uh, in Columbus. And I worked at Cummins for about 12 or 13 years. And uh, I started in environmental management. And you know, what did I know about private industry? What did I know uh, about diesel engines? Absolutely nothing. Why did they take me? Because I was a civil engineer, so I had uh, some knowledge about environmental concerns. And I had worked with government. Uh, granted, it was city government, but still understood government kinds of things, uh, regulations, et cetera. And so they taught me about diesel engines. Uh, they taught me about private sector, um, and I started out there. Mm -hmm. And um, I had, in the 12, 13 years, seven different jobs. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and what I f found is if I was going to be in private industry, I found the perfect one for my disposition, um, and personality, whatever, uh, because they were, uh, they, and I expect still are, uh, a firm that believed in moving people to try different kinds of things. Uh, they didn't have firm career paths. Uh, they liked people that had, I, from what I could tell, short attention spans like uh, me and were willing to try other things. Um, and so their personality was very different than a company equally successful like Caterpillar, where when you entered, you knew what your career path was. And for some people, it's a perfect match. That comes well, not having a career path, but having a path where you could try many things was the right place for me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I ended up, do, again, I found that I, I did a series 
pro- sort of first, you know, number one being a technical woman at a time when there were very few. Um, I was typically the first woman uh, doing these things. But so I was in environmental management. Um, I then went into an area that they called performance engineering, and this was looking at what were pr- problems with the uh, with engines that they were having. And I worked in fuel systems, and uh, what should they be doing um, to fix them? Because that costs customers. Uh, if they have uh, bad components, people don't want their engines, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was the first woman to work uh, in that area. Uh, I then went into program management, which was a real matrix organization, again, dealing with fuel systems, but how then do you correct these kinds of problems? Um, Again, uh, the first woman to uh, hold that kind of uh, position. Um, And what it was responsible for doing was getting all parts of the company together around a problem, find out what was the solution, get management agreement, and get it implemented. And so I did that uh, in introducing changes to fuel system um, and make introducing a new turbocharger, which was a component um, on the engine. Uh, I then moved into a new, mm, one way or the other, I think I worked, moved into uh, product planning. And there I worked uh, on a study with another uh, woman on Japanese entry into U.S. markets in diesel engines. Um, Neither of us ever went to Japan. We had lots of other people that did. So it was sort of a a paper study, but we basically put together uh, the plan for Cummins looking at how should it react to uh, international participation in in U.S. markets. Out of that also came uh, a study of, as they were trying to figure out new markets, electronics were uh, coming on, and I did the first marketing study for how should Cummins uh, enter and deal with electronics. Um, And some of that then got got implemented, but since I only stayed a few years on every job, I moved into a new engine line. They, They, at that point, started what they called the small engine. And I became uh, in charge of developing what they called the parts uh, marketing program for that. Um, led a, a, a process to decide what fuel system should be used on this small engine. And this was the first time that they were going to use a fuel system that was not their own design. And so it was a, a really interesting decision for them um, and a decision they made. Uh, and the, the initial one was uh, to actually go with two, not to choose just one, uh, but to two, choose two. Uh, and what was interesting, I have no idea if this is the direction you want to go, but was, what was interesting at the time was, uh, again, one company was very, I'll say, more conservative Uh, and probably more thereby stable, probably had a more traditional product that probably would have been, I'll call it just a good 80% solution. The other was much more creative, uh, had the 110% solution if they made it on time. And so Cummins chose to sort of spread the risk, and by doing that, I think came out with a, a good solution for them, but I, what I got out of it uh, was also a learning around how how companies make choices about who they want to be and how they then, uh, you know, what market they are going after and how do they then try uh, to sell themselves to somebody that needs their product. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the, the final, the, the, there were two other jobs I had there. Um, one is I went back and headed up the environmental management area. Uh, and one of the things that happened then uh, was uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, put out the most massive set of proposed regulations they had ever put forth, and this would have been in the early 80s, uh, on diesel engines and, and on engines going into uh, large over-the-road trucks. and 
it was they they were proposing a lot of changes uh, at that time. The the regulations dealt with measuring emissions on engines, and there were parts of the proposal that would say uh, that they you had to measure emissions in vehicles, and that for someone like Cummins and some other independent engine manufacturer would have been very burdensome because they sold engines to everyone. Uh, vehicle manufacturers that used only one engine or only several engines had a different kind of burden or, or less of a burden. And so we set up 10 work groups that worked for three or four months coming up with a response. And what was, I, I think, a bit unique around this, and it was a tribute uh, to the company and how they approached environmental regulations, was they, they uh, did not believe they had an inherent right to the marketplace. And so their view about if, if they were causing harm, they needed to do something to correct that or not be there. And so their approach to environmental regulations was, okay, do we agree with the premise? And people agree, do we need clean air? Do we need cl air that we can all breathe? Heavens, yes. Okay, here's a proposal of how to address it. Do we like it? No, you know, we can't do this, da, da, the usual complaints that you get. So then the next question uh, that got asked was, well, then what would you do differently? How would you approach it to get to that same goal? And so our, uh, our response sometimes came up with, you know, as much as we don't like what's being proposed, we can't come up with a better suggestion. Okay, now we understand. And it helped people in the company be more comfortable with why something, in quotes, was being done to them. The other was sometimes we could come up with some suggestions that made sense that you could explain in a way that the regulator would say, okay, yeah, we're still going to meet the goals that we believe and you know the country believes uh, is what we want, and they could make a modification uh, that then helped everybody. It was less expensive, it's more doable, et cetera. So I thought that was all very, very neat. And the other piece of it is for the first time in the company history, the president, once that whole thing went through, uh, he felt the effort was uh, so positive in terms of how the company approached it and the fact that we got heard and that the result was something that was good for everyone, is he actually had uh, a luncheon to celebrate and thank all the people, the 100 people that had been working on this for the number of months. Oh, very nice. The appreciation pays big dividends. It does. It yeah. does. Bigger than, the than you can imagine. Yes. The last job is relevant because it leads into my going into international development. Okay. Uh, Cummins was one of the early companies being in the automotive industry that when the Japanese and others came to the U.S. markets knew that things had to change. And so they set up an employee development center because what they wanted to do was start up small new businesses. They live in, their major operations are in southern Indiana, small town, what options do people have? And so they were trying to do things that would help people move into other jobs rather than get laid off and have no option. Well, it's a lot easier to lay people off than it is to build up new businesses, but Cummins was trying to do what they could. And the Employee Development Center was to be that interface. How do you take people from what was at that point a 20,000 person organization and help them move into businesses that might be 10, maybe up to a couple of hundred people. Uh -huh. People that came from manufacturing, from a research and engineering environment, or marketing, from all, all environments. And, and some of whom were contract, were, 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 uh, they, they had uh, local um, unions. They were not national unions, but local unions, and how to work with them. The process that we set up uh, was twofold. Number one, a recession came and there were people that were get, getting laid off. Uh, but the system we set up, we helped them set up a, a really a parts of outplacement so that they could help people getting um, outplaced. 
but on the on the uh, redeployment side into new businesses, one of the major businesses was an electronics business, and that and the other businesses wanted to have a system to get employees that could work in team environments. That was the other thing that was happening in the early 80s. And so we set up a process where union workers uh, could apply. And you would have a, a, a number of workers. It was more than just sort of what seniority would say, that you just take the top worker. You, we got the union to agree that a number of people could be interviewed for jobs, and you, but you as the employee could deselect. You could see what the job was going to be and decide whether or not you wanted to work in that environment. It was the first time the union employees had had what they saw as a choice to move or not. They liked it. The new businesses liked it, and what happened is that approach then got adopted by the company with the union for future contracts for the whole company. Mm -hmm. So that, and I used what I learned about how do new businesses start up uh, as, as sort of what I brought to the table in getting into international development, which is what I've been doing the last 20 years. Okay, okay. You want to talk a little bit about that, Mary Ann? Yes. Okay. Um, I found my own interests um, during the time that I was uh, at Cummins changing and looking at uh, where, where could Cummins sell diesel engines. We had like 80% of the U.S. truck market and had lots of, of non, uh, the market that were not in trucks in the U.S., but overseas a much more uh, limited presence. And especially in, in uh, on-the-road uh, products, uh, where the big markets were, uh, where, where the markets should be were in developing countries. Developing countries didn't have the infrastructure, economic or otherwise, to make use of the products. So how could you help countries build their economies so that they would need more uh, vehicles and need more engines and want to use Cummins? I mean, that was sort of economic development was sort of the logic. Uh, what I found is I got very interested in the broader subject of economic development, you know, and 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 so I made the decision um, that I needed to make the complete break. I, I looked to see is, heck, could I do something within Cummins and stay there, you know, do do the safe minor change, and sort of realized, uh, no, there, Cummins was a pretty open organization, but there were limits to what they could let. Uh, employees do since they were trying to make a profit. And so I decided to make the big leap and I left Cummins and came to Washington. Um, Cummins was very supportive. I found uh, Jim Joseph, who at that time uh, was head of Cummins Foundation, he was, he, he left, there were three major people that became part of, I think was the Carter administration. He, uh, he left and went to Council on Foundations uh, there was a Rick Haynes uh, who left. He became uh, ambassador to Algeria, uh, and then there was the head of the legal went to the Interior Department. There was a lawyer that we worked with who's based in Washington, who we worked with on environmental regulations. I found out she was on the board of two major development organizations in Washington. And so from the Cummins contacts, um, I came out here and started networking. And basically, I came out with no job, uh, spent time interviewing people that I said, hey, use my name, go talk to them, find, find out how to translate what you do into uh, the words of the development community. Um, and so I did that. I also took up French, um, since I had a lot of time, um, and took French classes. It, because I was interested in Africa as the primary place to work. Um, and so I started taking French classes two or three times a week at, a, at uh, one of the, the many language schools here uh, that work with um, the international organizations uh, who are trying to teach employees uh, foreign languages. Uh, 
the, after about three months, uh, I was able to do w what was almost volunteer work in Zambia. And in essence, uh, Cummins provided some, some uh, funding to the organization uh, that accepted me. Um, and I went to work with a village, it was called Village Industry Service in Zambia, that was an economic development organization. They were trying to make decisions uh, of providing support to small businesses in Zambia. And, they, and small businesses in Zambia there were really mostly informal organizations. I learned a whole lot about what was small business in the developing world. And what I helped them do was to set up a strategy of how the village industry service should market themselves, who should they go after, and who should they help support versus a similar organization that had been set up by another donor. Um, and so that was a three-month assignment. Uh, did that, came back. Um, the, the sort of the short end of that is it took hmm, a couple of years to get some really good contacts. I did some, I ended up renting, no, I ended up getting free office space from another person that I met uh, through networking at uh, Overseas Education Fund, OEF International. It's an organization that doesn't exist anymore, but it existed for about 20 to 30 years. It had been founded by League of Women Voters. They gave me office space to help uh, develop a strategic planning guide for non-governmental organizations. And so I worked on that with a staff member at OEF in exchange for office space. So that guide got used. I, in fact, used it in a number of other assignments. It got translated into French and was used by other people working in, in French-speaking uh, developing countries um, and provided me a track record to then sell myself to somebody else of what could I do, why would somebody want to hire me as a, a consultant. Okay. So, very good. What, what challenges you had and what initiatives came along with that? Which yes. is really good, really, yeah. really nice. What are you got? Are you, what are you current? You got a current project? What are you working on currently? Uh, the the last um, no, it's about five years. Uh -huh. um, in two thousand five, February, mm -hmm. um, I started working as a a consultant uh, on a ninety day contract with a new office in the State Department called the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. It had been set up about, not even a year before, um, as an initiative to try to figure out how to get U.S. government organization agencies that are working in what it come, it come to call fragile states, uh, to, for us to provide services in a more cohesive, integrated fashion that would be ultimately more beneficial, more effective for the country we're trying to work with. It developed out of lessons learned up to that point from our experiences in Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And so our office uh, was started, created in 2004. It started hiring some staff at the end of 2004. So my coming in February of 05, there were no more than 30 people in the office. Um, I was hired to, for 90 days to develop an initial training strategy for the U.S. employees that they were trying to prepare to go work in some of these uh, conflict, what they, they now call reconstruction and stabilization uh, kinds of projects. After the 90 days, they asked if I would like to stay on and implement the strategy. And so that's what I've been doing uh, over the last, now, um, almost five years. Mm, okay. Uh, and uh, what started as a one-person operation, uh, I'm now senior training advisor in that office, um, and it's now an office of uh, 10 people. Oh, very good. Growth is always good. <laughs> it is. <laughs> right. Uh, let's move where I want to talk, uh, make a couple comments on your awards yeah. and honors at Distinguished Engineering Alumni Award. That's very nice. 
and, and uh, uh, what to me was quite quite an honor. Right. Um, I usually ask people, were you a bit surprised when you first when you heard about it, or? Yes. Good. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Good. Um, and one of the things that remains surprising to me is I have no idea where the wording came from that was on it, but whoever came up with it has provided me a way to describe uh, what I do, because it, it, I don't have the exact wording, but but. What I have done is worked with a lot of startup and major change efforts, startup organizations or startup efforts and major change efforts. And what the recognition was, was using organizational and leadership abilities to take ideas from concept to implementation and in applying engineering skills to do that. And in thinking about it, that is exactly what I have been doing. That you know, It looks like uh, I have a short attention span and I keep moving, but I've applied the same skills over and over. Mm -hmm. What I've gotten out of it is learning sort of a new context. And so it, In it's which been, to apply the skills. Exactly, exactly. And so I, I probably will never find out who came up with those words, but I'm so thankful because uh, it helped me a lot when I said, what I do is... <laughs> there you go. You got it right yeah. there. Yeah. And you also served on the... Uh, Still with the Purdue Engineering Alumni Association, you're the first uh, female representative on that board. Are you still on that board, Marianne? Uh, I'm not. I'm not okay. uh, the, the dean's advisory uh, committee. Uh, I was on in the early '80s, and okay. am no longer on that. Okay. Um, let's see. I yeah, I came to Purdue an awful lot uh, once the women in. The, engineering programs that started, you know, from Donna Froreich on. Sure. I got involved when I was at Cummins a lot with recruiting and so got back there a lot. When I was in Chicago um, through ASCE, I uh, got to do a career day at one of the technical high schools. And a kid came up who was wanted to go to Purdue in, I think, nuclear engineering. His name was Tony Harris. He came and graduated in mechanical engineering, and there's a DEA from about two years ago. Who's one of the founders of the National Society. Right. Yep. Right. Exactly. And Purdue, uh, I was at Purdue during the time Nesby was formed, and there were some people from Cummins that helped provide support for that. So I, I've uh, known Marion Blaylock from the time she started uh, helping that group get formed. Right. Yeah. You also, uh, you came as an old master participant, too, at one time. I did. You? Yeah. you, you uh, remember better than I some of these things. And I also was And they're meeting the now. This week was the old masters. They just uh, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, and I was also, um, when civil engineering had their 100th anniversary, uh, I was one of the speakers. Mm -hmm. And it was on uh, civil engineering, uh, something like in a, in a global environment. And what struck me a lot coming back, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in hearing what the, both the university and civil engineering in the global focus that they have, um, well, just how much it makes sense. I mean, we are in a global environment, and uh, Purdue has had its history of, of links uh, to the world, and I think a lot of the efforts that are happening now uh, that are very creative are, I think, are good to help a lot of U.S. students um, that don't may not have had the chance uh, to see a, a wider view to do so, and then see reasons to make linkages that they might not otherwise right. do. Good point. Good point. Let me ask you about SWE. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there some award that you have given, or, or you have had some involvement? Yes. I don't. I'm. Uh, I drew a blank on the exact name, but I have been there and seen you give that award. Right, and, and I, there are two endow small endowments that I have. The, okay. the one uh, with women in engineering started when I was in graduate school. All right, okay. And uh, the name of it changed, which is one of the reasons why the name is always hard to quite get. I believe now it's actually uh, sort of the Zimmerman Award. Okay. Uh, but it was for women in engineering. I remember that. I thought there was, there was a combination. You put the yeah. names in there. And, and, and uh, one of the things that was really neat in its start, because it, it was started 
uh, with the help of the Zimmerman family, who have been major contributors, but also in getting it started, Mortarboard contributed, and then a number of the women engineering alums who existed at that time. And at that point, there were probably no more than about 100 women who had ever graduated from Purdue, and the number that were alive at that time were not a lot. So while it was not very many, and the amount was small, that initial startup was through that threesome. Okay. The Zimmerman family, mortar board, and uh, women engineering alums. Then over the years, uh, uh, the Zimmermans, the three, my parents and I, continued to contribute. And it started because of the fact that uh, in, I think it was first awarded in 1967, and it was open at that time to the junior or senior woman the, who had the highest grades at the end of the first semester. And it was an encouragement for women to be in engineering. Why? Two reasons. Number one, why the junior or senior uh, was because there were not always women undergraduates in every class. There were still times when there would be nobody, say, in the senior class. Um, the second uh, reason was women still had a hard time getting engineering jobs. I, I got an engineering job. I had a couple of offers uh, when I got out of school, but there were other women who still found that they were being offered uh, maybe technical jobs but not engineering, more technician kinds of jobs. And certainly at that point, cities like Chicago had technical schools that girls couldn't enter and those were the main sources of engineering students from cities like that. So it was trying to open up uh, the world um, to that. That then is why Purdue uh, was in the forefront of getting women in engineering programs and then my, and minority in engineering programs started. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the, the second endowment uh, that just now is in sort of the third year of, of being offered is uh, again sort of Zimmerman family. Uh, in civil engineering and uh, it's, it's innovation, I think it's Mary Ann Zimmerman uh, Innovation Award in Civil Engineering and the idea there uh, was sort of looking at civil engineering as a, as a profession uh, and the, the idea really came out of the looking at global uh, so it was really at the 100th anniversary the ideas sort of first started percolating, didn't start trying to put money together until about six, seven years ago. Um, and it was, what could a little bit of money do to help foster a creative idea, however defined, that a student, a faculty member, uh, an administrator might have? Didn't want to get it really defined, wanted to leave it open to whatever current definition uh, would handle. When I was a senior, one of the things that happened is I wanted to go, uh, and, and this was giving me some ideas, to an urban planning workshop at MIT. Found out there was a little bit of funds, and it was purely by chance I had access to knowledge that student government had some funds. And I was able to get like the $500 that allowed me to go to that function and the sponsorship to go to that function. So it was from something as simple as that to whatever. Um, and what I found out in coming back in October, the first chance I uh, had to come back and talk to how is civil engineering looking at that, they used it for the first couple of years when the amounts were uh, fairly small to sort of build on uh, some of the general uh, engineering entry program to help students uh, from minority groups get to know civil engineering as an option. What they did this past year is make two small awards, um, one to uh, an engineer who is doing water research up in Lake Michigan in the Gary area, uh, trying to see the impact of uh, environmental concerns on the beaches up in Lake Michigan. Uh, and so there, the ideas around environmental impact in a, uh, an economically stressed area is a really neat uh, way. And, and why is a small amount helpful? 
as he explained to me, is you can't, in order to apply to a grant for a large grant, you have to prove that you can do it. A small amount of money can be the trigger for you to be able to show that you can do what you want to do with a, a big grant. Yeah. Now, it's, like, it's like seed money, gets you started. It's absolutely seed sure, money. Sure. The second right. thing That's is good. around the, the global impact is Civil uh, has had for a couple of years uh, and is trying to continue um, a program where they have sent mm, something around 10 students for a two-week trip. First year it was to Turkey with a, a professor originally from Turkey. There it was to study and look at earthquake issues. And Civil Engineering has just gotten a very, very large grant uh, around earthquakes. And then uh, I think a year ago, they went to China, and they have a new program in architectural engineering. They have a, a woman professor originally from China who was able to bring the students to understand, uh, you know, around the Olympics is what I'm remembering and some of the other major new, like the, the um, what is it, the bird's nest. She knew uh, the architectural and the engineering firms in China that designed and built these buildings to help the students see, uh, for me, in a developing country context, in a different country context, how you use civil engineering. And uh, from my own view of the world view kind of thing, again, a wonderful way uh, to apply and help uh, engineering students see a broader application of the skills that they're learning uh, in the world. All right, good point, excellent. Um, now we're getting down to the uh, closing. How about a Purdue tradition? Does one come to mind for you? Uh, chords. Okay, okay. All right, we have a couple in the archives. We've got them as donations. <laughs> um, outstanding event. That's a tough one. Okay. I can have more than one. People always say, do I have to have one? I said, no, people have well, more. Well, I, I ended up uh, writing down about four things. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely different. But the DEA event itself coming back with my parents. I've had some extended family come, uh, and all SWE was there, uh, and uh, the SWE chapter gave me uh, a gift that I still have, a Steuben glass. Um, then two things with my parents and their anniversary. One is uh, their 40th wedding anniversary, again, with extended family in Jamaica. Uh, their anniversary uh, was around Thanksgiving. And I said, my parents never would go and just sit on a beach. They don't do things like that. And my friends uh, in Chicago said, have you ever asked? And I said, well, actually, no. And my parents went and loved it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the 40th wedding anniversary. And ex the extended family is important because they're the folks uh, that we all became friends during civil rights, uh, including with my parents uh, back uh, 68 on, mm -hmm. and so they're still my family. And then uh, the other part is my parents came for their 49th wedding anniversary uh, to Senegal when I was working in Senegal, and the staff celebrating with them uh, and vice versa that and uh, was just a really neat event. And then uh, one other thing was inauguration, election night and inauguration. Um, because the whole thing with Obama and Clinton, I am a, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat, have to admit that and have been, will continue to be. And so, yeah, I was torn uh, between, uh, as, as opponents in the, the primary, between Obama and Clinton. Uh, I think uh, where things have gone with uh, Obama in terms of having been the candidate and the vision uh, kind of thing in the election, uh, and Hillary Clinton becoming uh, Secretary of State is a wonderful match uh, in terms of where things uh, are going. And I had a lot, several friends stay with me on Inauguration Day and Election Night. There were phone calls going all over the country. Um, and just the, the whole thing of hope and, and given sort of the, uh, the global vision of the world and the hope that, that for me, uh, has come, even though the, the, the reality of getting to some of the, the, the goals will take a long time to get sure, there, right. but the energy that came from those events um, 
it was an outstanding event in my life. Good, very good. Marianne, I'm going to leave it uh, for you to make some closing uh, comments, if you will. Anything special or something we didn't ask or you'd like to make an, uh, any comment? Or uh, I think we covered everything. That, that also is your, uh, in your, how you feel. I pro probably have said more than enough, but uh, one of the things that is important, because we're dealing with Purdue, Purdue has been a very important, continues to be a very important part of my uh, life. The contacts I made there, students, uh, faculty, and administration have been a constant throughout. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of Purdue. Uh, and I appreciate the things Purdue gave me then and now. And I hope to keep that, uh, that link very good. That's very nicely said. Mary Ann, I want, on behalf of the Oral History Program, I want to thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, and I look forward to getting together with you next time you're on campus. Just give me a little bit of a heads up, okay? I shall, and thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, bye-bye now. <clears throat> so long.